Listener note, this episode contains descriptions of suicide and may not be suitable for everyone. Wondering. Imagine, you're 46 years old and having lunch with your old friend Ted at a private club. It's the kind of place where power brokers talk business over plates of filet mignon and lobster tail. A waiter in a tuxedo approaches and carefully sets down a gold-rimmed plate in front of you. For the lady, Waldorf salad. Thank you. You smile at the waiter, but he doesn't smile back. Even though you've been wealthy all your life, these stuffy places make you feel awkward, uncomfortable. But Ted doesn't seem to have a care in the world. He downs the last of his martini and dives into his shrimp cocktail. How are you? It must feel odd coming in here by yourself. It does, a bit. But I'm getting used to it. But the truth is, you're not used to it. Not really. Like a heavy weight. You can feel the men at the other table staring, whispering. You imagine what they must be saying about you. That poor woman. Ted clears his throat, and you snap out of it. I assume this isn't a strictly social lunch. Well, I'd like to make you an offer, if we were to create a position for you at the company. Well, there's only one job I want at your company. Really? What's that? He smirks and gives you a cold stare. I want your job. You're so startled you drop your salad fork. Behind his horn-rimmed glasses, there's a twinkle in Ted's eye. He's enjoying making you uncomfortable. You do your best to brush it off. Very funny. I'm serious. Step aside and let me run the company for you. Or sell it. I know a very interested buyer. I could broker a favorable deal. You'd be rich. Well, richer. You're too shocked to speak. The company is your birthright. It's been the family business for 30 years. Ted knows that better than anyone. What could possibly make him think you'd sell? That's when you notice. He's giving you a look. It's an expression that lately you've seen on too many people's faces. A look of pity. You ball up your fists and squeeze them tight as the anger rushes into your trembling hands. Ted sets down his fork and shakes his head. Look, you know I'd do anything to help if I thought I could. But you're not cut out for this. Just sell. Walk away. You'll be much happier. Deep down, you fear that he's right. Maybe you'd be happier if you just sold off the company. You used to dream of overseeing the whole company, but the reality of it is, it's overwhelming. There's so much to learn, and after being a housewife for so many years, well, you're not sure you'll ever learn how to run the business. But then, you unclench your fists and breathe. This company was your father's pride and joy. Something to be handed down over generations. One day, your own children will run it. At least, that's the plan. But for that plan to work out, you're going to have to prove your doubters wrong. You're going to have to be a leader, no matter how scared it makes you feel. Because if you don't, how will you ever look at yourself in the mirror again? From Wondery, I'm Virginia Madsen, and this is Imagine Life. Have you ever wondered what it would feel like to walk in the shoes of someone famous? On each episode of Imagine Life, we take you on an immersive journey into the life of someone you may think you know, maybe even admire, or the opposite, before the whole world knew their name. You will experience the challenges, the heartbreaks, the loss, and the triumph. There will be clues to your identity along the way. But only at the end will you find out who you are. So, sit back, let go, and imagine your life. This episode, The Caretaker. Imagine, you're 28 years old, home alone with your two young children. It's the nanny's day off, your least favorite day of the week. Donnie? Are you all right, sweetie? You rush into the living room to find your one-year-old sprawled on the floor, screaming. You must have forgotten to close the side of his crib again. You scoop him up in your arms. There, there, sweetie. It's all right. It's all... Something's burning. All your life, you've been an overachiever. You've excelled at anything you put your mind to. School, sports, work. There's only one thing you're lousy at, and it's this. 
being a housewife. Mommy! You run into the kitchen where your three-year-old daughter is pointing at the stovetop. Gray smoke billows from a pot on one of the burners. A baby bottle. Great. Now the plastic bottle is melted all over the pot. A chemical smell fills the room. Your daughter holds her nose. It stinks, Mommy. You open some windows and sit wearily at the kitchen table. Why don't you go out and play? Mommy's going to clean up in here. It's not like you had to choose this life. When you and your husband first got married, he encouraged you to keep working. But then you had Elizabeth, and then little Donnie. When your husband got back from the war, he went to work in the family business as your father's number two man. It just made sense for you to stay home with the kids, and most days you don't mind. But on days like this... Hi, honey. What's that smell? Everything okay? It's your husband. Even now, after six years of marriage, seeing him still makes your heart beat a little faster. He's tall, brown-haired, with a wry smile. Always upbeat and bursting with energy. Sometimes a little too much energy. He lifts Donnie out of his crib like he's about to toss his infant son across the room. You're home early. I couldn't wait to tell you the big news. Your father's stepping down. He plans to leave the company at the end of the month. Does that mean... Yep. I'll be taking over the business. But it's so soon. Are you sure you're ready? He flashes that smile of his. That smile that everyone loves. That seems to say he's not taking any of this too seriously. Only one way to find out, right? Well, that's wonderful news. And it is wonderful news. You're proud of your husband. He's the smartest man you've ever met. And since joining the family business six months ago, he's worked hard to earn his place there. But you feel something else, too. You're just a tiny bit jealous. Before you had your first child, you worked at your father's company for six years. You did menial jobs and learned the business from the ground up. You harbored hopes that one day you'd run the business yourself. Now your husband gets to swoop in and take over the whole operation after just six months? It doesn't seem fair. You have a third child, then a fourth. And soon, you forget about any dreams you once had that you'd run the business. Besides, your husband's doing a great job. He expands the company, buys out a major rival. He's busier than eight bird dogs, as he likes to say. He's at the office constantly, and some nights he doesn't come home at all. You're proud of your husband, but your relationship isn't what it used to be. When you're together, well, it seems like the stress of the job is changing him for the worse. One night, you're at a dinner party with friends. They're business associates of your husband's, really the only people you socialize with these days. You're telling a story about your youngest child. Well, he's very precocious. The other day when I was feeding him, he took the spoon right out of my hand and... Your husband cuts you off. Stop boring our host, dear. Nobody cares about all that stuff. He's on his fourth scotch. Drinking brings out a cruel streak in him. And although it stings, you try to laugh it off like you always do. You're right, dear. There I go, prattling on again. When dinner's over, you and the other wives head to the living room. The men stay behind with their scotches and cigars. On the way out, you overhear your husband bragging. I'm telling you, my company's going to be the biggest in the country. Five years is all I need. It's all about acquisitions, technology. By the time you leave, your husband is too drunk to drive. He gives you the keys and slumps into the passenger seats. Our friends are idiots. You don't mean that. They still think I'm just the boss's son-in-law. Some glorified caretaker. They don't understand my vision. I'm not sure I understand it either. All that talk of expanding, won't that be taking on a lot of debt? Hey, who's running this company? You or me? You are, dear. That's right. Your father entrusted this business to me so you and everyone else could just butt out of it. I know what I'm doing. You want to believe that your husband knows best, but you're not so sure. Your husband used to be so confident and sure of himself, and now it feels like he's spinning out of control. And then, one night, something snaps. You wake up and discover that your husband is double over on his side of the bed. He's hugging himself and panting like he's out of breath. When you turn on the light, you're shocked at the look of agony on his face. Oh, my. What is it, dear? What's wrong? I can't go on like this. I feel trapped. I, I can't move can't go back to the office. I'm done. 
Well done. Not good enough. Honey, you are good enough. What can I do to help? Nothing. Leave me alone. The next morning, he refuses to get out of bed. And the morning after that, his eyes are red from crying. His pajamas reek of stale sweat. Your husband was once the most upbeat man you ever knew. Now he's paralyzed with despair. You consult with psychiatrists. They all say the same thing. Nervous breakdown. They say he just needs rest. But how is a man in charge of a rapidly growing business supposed to rest? Hello? Uh, it's John. Is he there? It's your husband's business manager. You don't dare tell him what's really going on. Oh, I'm sorry, John. He's still sick with the flu. You sure he can't just come to the phone? We're going to lose this deal if I don't get his sign off. You twirl the phone cord between your fingers, and then you get an idea. Well, tell them he says it's a bad deal anyway. Unless they can agree to more favorable terms, it's off. Are you sure that's what he said? Yes, I'm sure. All right. I'll pass that along. You tell yourself it's just a little white lie. Your husband's a strong negotiator. He would have done the same thing. Still, you can't help feeling a little thrill. If this is what it feels like to call the shots, well, you like it. After a few months, your husband gets better. At least, that's what it seems like at first. He's out of bed and full of energy. But his behavior is erratic. He's drinking more. He makes rash decisions. His mood swings back and forth wildly. Then one night, after a big fight, he leaves you. For weeks, you don't hear from him at all. And then you get the call you've been dreading from your attorney. He's filed divorce papers. Have you read them? What does he want? Well, he'll let you keep the house and the kids, but he wants the company. All of it. He wants to buy you out. You pause as those words sink in. He wants to force you out of your own father's company. It's your birthright. The business you are going to pass along to your children. You take a deep breath and tighten your grip on the receiver. Tell him... Tell him if he wants the company, he's going to have to fight me for it. Weeks turn to months. You and your husband talk only through lawyers. Your friends say he's still going into the office, but he's grown wild. He's throwing things, firing people one day, and rehiring them the next. You're worried about him, and the company. But you're not sure what you can do. Until one day, there he is, standing on your doorstep. I've called it off with a divorce lawyer. I just want to come home. You blink back tears. You still love this man, but you know you can't give in to him. Not that easily. We want you to come home, too, but first you've got to agree to get help. Of course. Whatever you think is best. He voluntarily commits himself to a psychiatric hospital. It's more like a college campus than a hospital with rolling lawns and tennis courts. And it keeps him away from the office. He can't do any more damage to your company. Not while he's in the hospital. You bring him lunch every day, and together you picnic on the grounds. It starts to feel almost normal. Slowly... You begin to fall in love with your husband again. Every day he seems more like his old self. Charming, witty, full of life. After six weeks, the doctors agree. They're willing to discharge him for a few days. That means you can spend the weekend at your country house, just the two of you. No kids, no distractions. It's a hot afternoon in August, and you've stretched out in the bedroom of your country house. Your ceiling fan blows a gentle breeze, and downstairs your husband is reading the paper. This weekend has been a godsend. It's just like old times. You haven't felt this relaxed in months. You're just beginning to drift off to sleep when... The sound jerks you awake. You leap to your feet and run out into the hallway. Darling, what was that? Is everything okay? No answer. You run down the stairs. A knot of panic is forming in your stomach. You know that sound. You've heard it when your husband goes bird hunting in the woods behind the house. You reach the downstairs bathroom door. Before you even open it, you can smell the gunpowder. You wish you could unsee it. Your husband's body, limp in the bathtub. The shotgun lying across his chest. The blood. You're in shock. You don't know what else to do, so you close the door. 
You go into the living room and you bury your head in your hands. Mm-hmm. You all right? Did he bring you anything? I need to find you. Know, you know. The next hours pass in a fog, until you look up from a couch and see an older man in a tweed suit standing over you. He flashes you a strange smile. You recognize him. He's one of your husband's senior executives. You try to smile back. So, what happens now? Well, that's up to you. Me? Well, yes, now that your husband's no longer with us, that means you oversee the whole company. You don't say another word, but your mind is racing because you realize that he's right. You're responsible to manage the entire company, and you have no idea what to do next. Your husband killed himself on Saturday. On Monday, just two days later... You walk into a large conference room, where a group of men sit murmuring. Today, your company's board of directors is holding an emergency meeting. You've been asked to say a few words, to reassure everyone about the company's future. And you're terrified. You take a seat at the head of a long table. You're wearing a black widow's dress, and you're surrounded by gray-haired men in gray flannel suits. You barely know any of them. They're your husband's friends, your husband's colleagues, not yours. How are you, of all people, supposed to reassure them? You're still in shock, and not used to public speaking, not used to being in charge. Opening your mouth feels like stepping off a cliff, but you clear your throat, look down at your notes, and begin. Good afternoon. I'd like to... to start by thanking you all for your support and um, professionalism during this difficult time. I hope that... I mean, I'm sure you'll hear many rumors about... um, About the future of this company. Your speech isn't the disaster you feared it would be, but it's not a triumph either. Word gets out that you seem weak and uncertain. And so, the vultures begin circling. Rival companies looking to buy you out. Everyone in town seems to be just waiting for you to fail. You quickly learn that you can't trust anyone, even old friends. Like the one you're having lunch with now, Ted. He presses you as you pick at your Waldorf salad. You're not cut out for this. Just sell, walk away. You'll be much happier. And maybe he's right. Maybe you should cash out. But if you do that, you'll always wonder, could you have done it? Could you have run the company yourself? Before your father put your husband in charge, that was what you secretly wanted all along. Well, here's your chance. You take a deep breath, lean across the table, and look your friend in the eye. My company is not for sale at any price. And the only person who's going to look after it is me. Ted looks startled. But then, he smiles. Good for you. I'll tell my buyer you're not interested. It's one thing to fend off buyers. It's another to actually oversee a multi-million dollar business. For advice, you turn to your husband's old business manager, John, who's now the company's CEO. You ask him to show how he runs the company, and he agrees... Reluctantly. You really sure you want the full tour? Yes, show me everything. John guides you around the plant floor. He stops at each piece of heavy equipment. He explains how it all works and fits together. It's an overwhelming amount of information. You scribble notes as fast as you can and look up at a massive machine. This one looks brand new. Oh yes, we just upgraded last year. It's very expensive, but the old unit was over 20 years old. It was on its last legs. Go on, I'll show you the warehouse and then I gotta get back to the office. I have a question. That one machine, if it's brand new, but all the other equipment is still old, well, we're not really benefiting from its newness, are we? He stops and squints his eyes. What are you talking about? I just mean, would it make sense to upgrade all of the equipment at once, so we're producing a better finished product? As I said, the equipment is very expensive, and if we were to upgrade the whole plant at once, it would set the company back millions. Yes, but couldn't you depreciate those costs? Depreciate? So, you're an accountant now. No, I just mean... Look, ma'am, your husband put me in charge of this place because he trusted me. And frankly, I run it better than he ever did. I don't doubt that, but if you... If you you don't doubt that, then stay out of my business. Tour's over. I have to get back to work. Over the next several weeks, you try your best to learn how the business works. 
But the men who run the day-to-day -day operations, and they're all men, they block you at every turn, especially John. One day, the two of you sit down in John's office and review the company's budgets. Now, as you can see here, last year we combined these two departments. I'm sorry, can you explain this part again about accrued expenses? We've been over this a million times. How do you expect to run this place if you can't read a balance sheet? You leave John's office fighting back tears just like you did last week, and the week before that. It's humiliating being spoken to this way, especially because you know he's right. You have to learn these things. So, you swallow your pride and keep asking questions. You talk to employees at every level of the company, asking them to explain their jobs, trying not to sound as totally clueless as you feel. But slowly, you begin to see the full picture, and it's not good. While your husband was sick, quality control went out the window. You realize the company's products are outdated, poorly constructed. The whole company is at risk. If it doesn't change soon, it could fall apart. And that means you're going to have to shake things up if you want to save the family business. And to do that, you need some good, honest advice. But there's only one place you can go for that. Your female friends. At least the few who've held positions of power themselves. You're having drinks at your favorite private club, the one where power brokers talk business over steak and lobster. Your friend sets down her fork and gives you some blunt advice. You want to fix this company? You have to be twice as smart as the men, twice as ruthless. Only then will they respect you and you can make the changes the company needs. But what about the ones that don't respect me, no matter what I do? Get rid of them. Oh, I don't know if I can do that. Look someone in the eye and fire them? Don't do it yourself. Delegate your dirty work but make sure everybody knows who made the decision. I understand. And if you still don't have the stomach for it, just bring in your own people. Hire new blood and put them in charge. The old guard will either have to get with the program or get out. So that's what you do. About a year after your husband's death, you hire a new assistant head of operations. But you give him more responsibility than that title suggests. And with your blessing, he goes on a hiring spree. He brings in new talent, Young, hard-working people bursting with new ideas. The old head of operations sees the writing on the wall and steps down after just a few months. And just like that, one roadblock crumbles. It won't be the last. With each passing year, your confidence grows. Together, you and your new head of operations make some difficult calls, like Rush releasing a new product in an effort to beat the competition to market. Just before dawn, you stand on the loading dock, you're watching the last of the trucks as they carry off your latest product. Soon it'll hit the market. You don't really need to be here, but you don't want to miss this proud moment. It's well worth the early hour and the stench of diesel fumes. One worker wipes the sweat from his forehead and turns to you. That's the last of them, ma'am. Very good. Tell everyone they can go home early today. You all did great work here. You turn and see John, your CEO, striding towards you through the warehouse. He doesn't look happy. So, you're in charge of shipping now? I'm in charge of everything, John. It's my company. Sometimes I think you forget that. And you are in charge. Over the next year, you make more and bigger moves. You restructure the company and give newer, younger employees more autonomy. You get rid of the deadwood, older managers who were loyal to your husband, but were never especially good at their jobs. Gradually, the energy around the office changes, People come to work excited. Sales and profits are up. You're learning to be a more hands-on executive. You study other companies, and you visit their headquarters to see what makes them successful. At a company called IBM, you attend a seven-day retreat for the country's top executives. You're there to learn about a brand new device, one that promises to change the business world. We call it the personal computer. It's so small. What does this button do? Your fellow executives, all men, Crowd around this strange little machine, and you savor the moment. Your male colleagues love to act as though they have all the answers. But here, in the presence of this strange new technology, they're clueless. Maybe you're not so out of place running your big family business. But no matter how much your confidence grows, there's one person you still can't impress. The CEO of your company, John. The two of you butt heads on just about everything. He's too valuable to fire outright, but you dread your weekly meetings with him. He always finds something to argue about. So today, as usual, there's a knot between your shoulder blades as you walk down the long corridor to his office. Why don't you ever meet in your office? 
You realize that in all these years, it never occurred to you to ask. John is sitting behind his big oak desk. As usual, he's hunched over a thick stack of budget reports, crossing things out with a red felt-tip pen. Usually, when you enter his office, he barely looks up. But today, he puts the reports aside and leans back in his swivel chair. I have some news that should make you happy. Oh? What's that? I've decided to retire. Actually, I guess I should rephrase that. I've decided to ask for your permission to retire. For you, it's a bittersweet moment. In many ways, John has been your nemesis. But you've learned so much from him. He's one of the last remaining executives from your husband's time. You don't need my permission, John. I'll be sorry to see you go. You were never a very good liar. It's true. You've been tough on me, but I needed it. I'm a better steward of this company because of you. You have grown into quite the leader. John puts the cap on his red-tipped pen, and for what seems like the very first time, he smiles at you. That's why when I formally announce that I'm stepping down, I'd also like to announce you as my replacement. President and CEO? You've teared up in John's office before, but always because you were on the losing end of a particularly vicious argument. This time, they're happy tears. Thank you, John. I think you're right. I think I'm ready. <laughs> you're at a big dinner party with friends from work. The food's cleared away, and normally the men stay around the table smoking cigars and drinking scotch. They talk shop and argue politics. The women, meanwhile, retire to the living room, where the conversation turns to women's interests. Children, clothes, home decorating, subjects that bore you senseless. Out of habit and politeness, you've always gone with the women, but tonight, you're fed up with the old way of doing things. When the women get up, you stay at the table with the men. There's an awkward silence. You're nervous, but you stay put. Your host puts down his scotch and looks at you. Everything all right? Yes. I just don't feel like talking about piano recitals and pot roast recipes. But I can see you're all uncomfortable with me crashing your little boys club. I think I'll just head home. You actually don't want to leave, of course. But your host's face turns red with embarrassment. Oh, nonsense. Stay, please. Can we pour you some scotch? That would be lovely. And while you're at it, why don't you invite your wives back in and see if they might like some too? It's a small act of rebellion, but the response is overwhelmingly positive. Several women at the party thank you later in private. And that gets you thinking. If you can call out sexism at the dinner table, where else can you use your power? You decide to start at the office. You begin with small changes in conversations with executives. That new girl in your department, what's her name? Meg. Ah, she's terrific, isn't she? When we were working on a project together, it's like two people playing chopsticks. Well, why don't you promote her? You need a good associate director. Unless you think it would be too awkward to share your responsibilities with a woman. Uh, no, of course not. I think that's a great idea. And then you make changes across the company. Personnel? Hi, it's me. I was just looking at this memo you sent around, and I noticed something. All the men are called by their last name, but the women are called by their first name. Mary will report to Jones, for instance. Don't you think that's odd? Oh, not really. It makes the men sound more important. It's subtle, I admit, but it's biased. We should establish a uniform way of doing it. Um, but, ma'am... I prefer first names myself. It's friendlier. But do whatever you think is best, so long as it's uniform. Understood? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Thank you. You take more high-profile stands outside the company, where gender discrimination is more deeply ingrained. Many professional organizations in your industry still don't admit women. So, when one group invites you to be their guest of honor, you decline. That gets you an angry phone call from their president. We're trying to honor you. Well, I'd only be there as a guest, correct? Not as a member? As a guest, yes. I, I can't change our membership rules just for you. They've been in place 85 years. Well, women couldn't vote in this country for over a century. Rules can be changed. And I'd rather be treated as an equal than honored. So, until you can make me a member, I won't accept your invitation. Under your leadership, the company becomes more than just a family business. It's now an industry leader with international recognition. But, as you soon discover, that comes with its own perils. One night, you're hosting a farewell party for a veteran employee. As you stand and talk with your friends, one of your advisors pulls you aside. Yeah, ma'am, we have a problem. You quickly retreat to a private room. 
There, he explains the situation. Government officials are threatening to block the release of one of your new products. One you put a lot of hard work into. You're proud of this product, but it's also controversial. Your advisor reminds you there's a lot on the line. If we get shut down over this, the company could potentially go bankrupt. Is it too late to cancel the release? No, but if we back down, it could set a dangerous precedent for our whole industry. Who's working on this? Ben and his team. Ben, your trusted head of operations. You breathe a little easier knowing that he's on the case. All right. Have him call me when he's ready to make a decision. Yes, ma'am. You return to the party, but your mind is elsewhere. Does the future of your company really depend on this one product? An hour later, you're in the middle of giving a toast when your advisor taps you on the shoulder and whispers into your ear. I've got Ben calling. And Fritz. Fritz, your company's chief legal counsel. It must be serious. You turn back to your party guests, flash your warmest smile, and finish your toast. And then you rush away to your private library. Close the library's heavy sliding doors and grab the phone. Ben sounds almost frantic. We need a decision and we need it right now. If we wait even one day, they'll serve us with an injunction and shut the whole thing down. And your recommendation is to go ahead with it? Yeah. I'd stake my career on it. Fritz, what do you think? Fritz, your legal counsel, has been with you longer than anyone, going back even to your father's days running the company. He pauses a long time before finally answering. Well, I think no. I wouldn't do it. You weigh these two conflicting pieces of advice. They're from two of the people you trust most in the world. But in the end, you realize it's not up to them. It's up to you. You've already spent too much of your life letting people make decisions for you. This decision, the biggest of your life, has to be yours and yours alone. All right. Let's go. Let's publish. Your hands are shaking as you hang up the phone. You know that because of this one decision, your life and your company will never be the same. And you know in your bones that you made the right call. In the weeks and months that follow, you feel vindicated. The government backs down. Your publication runs more stories about the secret documents called the Pentagon Papers. With each new story, public opinion turns more deeply against the war in Vietnam. And your publication is hailed as a champion of the First Amendment, exposing lies and corruption at the highest levels of government. A year later, Ben introduces you to a young reporter. He's here to discuss your newspaper's latest investigative series. Kay, I'd like you to meet Bob Woodward. Hello, Bob. You've been doing great work on the Watergate stories. I hope you don't plan to let up. Not a chance, ma'am. As president and publisher of the Washington Post, you become the first woman ever to lead a major American newspaper. Together with your executive editor, Ben Bradley, you oversee two of the most important journalistic exposés of the 20th century, the release of the Pentagon Papers and the investigation of the Watergate scandal. Your fearlessness in the face of overwhelming pressure not to publish, and your willingness to stake the paper's survival on the truth, keeps the public informed at a critical moment. And in 1974, those stories helped force President Richard Nixon to resign. Decades later, Hollywood dramatizes these events in the film The Post, earning Meryl Streep an Oscar nomination for her portrayal of you. By the mid-1970s, no one is more surprised than you at how far you've come from your days as a housewife. After your husband Phil Graham's suicide put you in charge of the paper in 1963, your peers and colleagues expected you to be a figurehead. But under your leadership, The Post becomes a journalistic powerhouse. It wins 19 Pulitzer Prizes and emerges as one of the country's leading newspapers, on par with your rival, The New York Times. You continue to preside over The Washington Post as president and publisher until 1979, when your son Donald becomes publisher. This keeps the paper in the family, just as your father, Eugene Meyer, intended when he purchased it in 1933. You stay on as chairwoman of the board until 1991, and then retire to write your memoir and focus on your philanthropic work. That same year, Ben Bradley also steps down. You win a Pulitzer of your own in 1998 for your memoir, Personal History. The book is an unflinching account of your husband Phil's struggles with mental illness and the challenges you faced from all the people who underestimated you. In 2002, a year after your death at the age of 84, President George W. Bush honors you with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. You're buried in Oak Hill Cemetery in Washington, D.C., next to your husband, Phil, and right across the street from your former home, the one where you said those fateful words, let's go, let's publish. I just felt that the, the editors were right and that 
that we had to go ahead. So I said, okay, go. You are Catherine Graham. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Imagined Life. If you did, please subscribe right now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Wondery.com, or wherever you're listening. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast, where you'll find a link on the episode notes and some offers from our sponsors. By supporting them, you help us offer you this show for free. If you like what you're hearing, we'd love for you to give us a five-star rating and leave a review. We love to know your thoughts, but please be considerate of other listeners by not spoiling the surprise. Tell your friends and family about this show and show them how to subscribe. Another way to support us is to answer a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. And a quick note about recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what we said. Those scenes are dramatizations, but they're based on historical research. If you'd like to learn more about Catherine Graham, we recommend her memoir, Personal History. I'm your host, Virginia Madsen. Andy Herman wrote this episode. Sound design is by Misha Stanton. Audio assistance by Sergio Enriquez. Our senior producer is Benjamin Gray. Produced by Gabe Riven and Natalie Shisha. Our executive producers are Jenny Lauer Beckman, Stephanie Jens, and Marshall Louie. Imagine Life was created by Hernan Lopez for Wondering. Wondering.